you everyone for coming to the Huxley Speaker Series. My name is Jean Melius and I'm a faculty member at Huxley College of the Environment. And I need one minute for logistical items. We have students here who take the Speaker Series for one credit. And I want to let them know that next week we're not having a Speaker Series. And this will pertain to all of you as well uh, because it's the Huxley Career Fair. So for those in the class, your assignment is to go to the career fair, talk to two potential employers, and tell me how it went. Uh, and then our speaker series will start up again the following Thursday. I put one speaker who will be here on the 28th on the board for those who are interested in waterfront planning. We hope you come in here, Ken Johnson, whose firm has been involved in a number of Seattle public developments, including the Seattle Waterfront. Uh, and here is our segue. Mr. Johnson, like Dan Pike, is a Huxley <laughs> alumnus. And our speaker series this quarter is focusing on our alumni and how many of them are coming back and coming into Huxley to share their experiences and their insights with, with us, and we really appreciate it. So Dan Pike is the president of Sustainable Solutions, a consulting firm specializing mm -hmm in helping firms in need of strategic transportation management planning and assistance. Prior to that position, Mr. Pike served as the 20th mayor of Bellingham. Mayor Pike's administration focused on an open collaborative government while addressing key issues such as waterfront redevelopment, Lake Whatcom water quality, permitting environmental protection and neighborhoods. Uh, mayor Pike graduated from Huxley College in 1994 and Harvard University with his Master's of Public Administration degree. And I'm sure you'll all join me in welcoming Dan Pike. Well, thank you, uh, Professor Melius, I guess, if you're calling me Mr. Pike. Um, <laughs> but. Uh, you know, it's a pleasure to be back here. I, I really valued the time I, I attended Huxley as a student. Um, my undergraduate career was the 19 best years of my life. Um, <laughs> my mother was thrilled I finally got through with that. But, uh, but, but I did learn a lot that, that I've continued to carry forward from Huxley. And so when Gene asked me to talk a little bit about that, I thought I'd talk about sort of how my Huxley education framed my thinking and how that thinking, how I, how I apply that to looking at the waterfront, which is, I think, something that's very um, much on the minds of a lot of people in this community today and has been for a long time. I'm going to start by just talking a little bit about Huxley College. And I think Huxley is an amazing institution. And actually, Western has a really interesting and, I think, effective um, set up for how they've got their colleges. They've got a cluster of colleges, each of which have different focuses, but which complement each other and which can work together really well. Um, and, and Huxley, I think, really emphasizes interrelationships among disciplines in a way that helps us think um, globally about problems, about thinking about things holistically. And I think if I was going to sum up Huxley in one word, it would be ecology. And the reason I I choose that word is because Huxley is associated with natural systems. Ecology is the study of natural systems. But also, it's a study of systems first and foremost. And it's a scientific study. There's a lot of folks that will do ad hoc analysis and say they believe something very strongly um, without really undergoing the rigor that I think helps you get to understanding things in a way that gets to um, good, viable, ongoing solutions. And I think that understanding systems is really effective in finding good solutions to problems, whether they're natural or man-made systems that we're looking at. You know, as we're trying to solve problems in a rapidly changing world, absent a systemic perspective, we'll look at a problem and we'll solve that problem in isolation. And oftentimes what happens is we compound the problem. So, for example, I had Gene put this um, slide up of the granary just because I think it's emblematic of a lot of what's going on, a lot of the frustrations and also the opportunities that we have at the waterfront. And if you look at an old abandoned building like this in isolation, and I love that somebody keeps trimming the, the ivy on there to make it be a heart, but, um, but if you look at that in isolation, 
clearly probably the most cost-effective thing to do would be to demolish it and build something new. And it makes building the next structure easier. It's, it's fairly inexpensive to do. I think a fellow Huxley alum, Dave Benning, would prefer that we deconstruct it as opposed to demolish it. But, but anyway, you make it go away, then you've got a new surface to do whatever new thing you want to do there. But I've talked to a really wide spectrum of developers and historic preservationists. And to a person, I think they agree that if you only looked at the granary by itself, it would be a challenge to redevelop it in a way that made financial sense. But also to a person, they say that if you look at it in the context of the larger waterfront redevelopment, it adds tremendous value to everything else on the waterfront if it's there, and you, there's a tremendous loss if it's gone. And it's also a really vi valuable co um, connection, both visually and in terms of if it was redeveloped as a focal point between the waterfront and Old Town and Downtown Bellingham. And one of the things that, from the city's perspective at least, was always a focus was making sure that whatever we did on the waterfront wasn't something that was going to damage our downtown. And so, you know, I would say that easier is demolishing it and building something else, but easier isn't always the answer. That, that community matters and history matters. And I, I love the Satyana quote, which is, those who forget the past are condemned to repeat it. And if we just wipe our past away, we lose a lot um, from our community. So that's kind of where we, where we come from a little bit. But, but uh, let me talk about where we were, how we came to have these properties. For some time, it was obvious to a number of folks in the community that GP was likely to shut down at some point. And a number of folks, and I see some of them in the room, I saw John Blethen somewhere, and I see a number of other folks, um, including an old professor that I had for Architecture Man and the Environment uh, at Western many years ago, <laughs> uh, and, uh, which, which got me interested in some of this historic stuff. Um, but, but we were shutting down and a bunch of, or we thought GP was going to shut down at some point. We got a bunch of folks, a bunch of folks got together and started thinking about, well, what if they shut down? What can we do? What should we do? And, and they brought in a, a group of um, designers and architects for an exercise called RUDET, which is Regional Design Urban Assistance Team, back in 1992. This is well before GP sh shut down their operations here. And, and they envisioned a lot of what since has, was later put into uh, visualization as, as the Blethen plan or the Blethen Christensen plan that helped a lot of people think about things. And then there was um, the city put a lot of effort into, into having a waterfront visioning project, as did the port. And, and a lot of those ideas about having a robust parks present, connectivity to the waterfront, um, a mix of uses, um, preserving some of the old structures and some of the views and things like that, started back then. Um, and then GP actually did decide they were going to close up shop in Bellingham. And for a variety of reasons, the city was unable to purchase the property. And the port, to its credit, stepped up and kept that community vision alive by arranging to purchase the, the GP property from Georgia Pacific. And actually, it was more of they agreed to take on the unfunded liabilities of the project in exchange for not requiring GP to keep most of those liabilities. They still have some that are, if it gets really, really expensive, GP kicks back in uh, as a funder. But, but, but the port stepped up and they saved this property. So I always like to say that because I do share criticisms of the port, but I think it's important to recognize we wouldn't even be here if the port hadn't stepped up. So at the time that I took office, um, it was clear to me from having talked to a lot of the community, I doorbelled about 7,000 houses the first time around. And, and this site was a major part of those conversations. And it was clear to me that the community wanted redevelopment, but it had to include a significant parks component and that had to have a community, uh, an alignment with community vision. Um, the port. I think was drawn into this initially because they saw an opportunity to build uh, a clean ocean marina where the aerated stabilization basin or, a or ASB 
which is basically where GP processed their, treated their water from their operations. Um, they, they saw that as an opportunity to open that up a little bit and you could have a marina, a world-class marina for very large yachts and to expand the marina capacity we had. Uh, they also wanted at that time six million square feet of development uh, with the key infrastructure provided by the city largely at the city's expense. And there were some significant disagreements between the port and the city under my administration on those, on those points. So that brings us to where we are now, and, and, and there's some good news in where we are now. Um, there seems to be some cleanup that's starting to happen, uh, and that's been a long time coming, and I think all of us want to see that happen. Uh, there seems to be a high level of agreement between the port and the city these days, which was not the case when I was in office, um, and some long stalled land swaps that have been proposed for some time are now coming to fruition. So there's some movement happening, and I think certainly a lot of the community would like to see some movement happen on that. It's very frustrating to see this large piece of land that could be so valuable and meaningful for our community laying there fallow. But unfortunately, along with the good news of having some progress, there's the bad news of where that progress seems to be taking us. And I think where it's taking us is inconsistent with the community vision that, that I heard about when I was campaigning in 2007 and also the, the city and the port heard about, we had a series of meetings in the fall of 2008 that were attended by hundreds of people at Market Depot Square, where I think at, my perception was the port leadership at that time really thought the community was going to embrace the vision the port presented, and they didn't. The community was very clear that they wanted to preserve a lot of the historic buildings. They were concerned about view corridors and other things that were at odds with the way the port was presenting realigning and redeveloping the waterfront. Um, and, and so since that time, you know, at, at that point, we were at an impasse because there was a hard time getting both sides to agree on something that, in my mind, accommodated the community's vision. And now what we're having is we're having, I think, some, some a losing of gains that were lost when I was in office. So for example, there had been an agreement of a broad swath of parks all along the water's edge throughout the, throughout the waterfront property. And now a significant portion of that is being proposed to be taken away for redevelopment uh, as um, an, an industrial base. And I don't think that that's a bad conversation to have but I will say it makes me nervous when I hear them say, we want to take that away, and at some point in the future, we'll identify a different place to give you those parks. And if you're taking away waterfront park access, I think the community needs to know, when you're taking that away, how you're going to replace that, what you're going to do to make that work for the community, because that is an irreplaceable asset. And so there, there is a very real trade-off that's necessary at times between jobs and other amenities, but I think that at least we need to have an informed discussion about what that, what that looks like. Um, additionally, historic structures seem to be undervalued, but they're not really being offered to the developing public in a way that, that allows for a meaningful proposal to be brought forward that's likely to succeed. I think that right now the RFP that's put out for the granary, for example, is most likely to show that you can't do it and I think sometimes you put out an RFP to get the answer that you want. And, and I guess I, I'd say that distresses me a little bit because I think that that does offer tremendous potential value to the community. Um, and the public has identified historic aspects of the waterfront as a key component to save. And so I think if you're an elected official and the public overwhelmingly wants something, you should try to be responsive to the public. In addition, I. I'm losing sight of some agreements that the city and port had, and I'm not aware that they've been undone, and so I, I sense they're being ignored, and maybe I'm wrong on this, but for example, the port and city agreed after a lot of haggling to, not to, to forestall demolition of a number of projects. We, we, uh, looked, we, we brought in Johnson Architects out of Seattle, the ones that redid the Rainier building into a mixed-use artist's loft area, and 
they identified a number of structures. They identified a couple structures that were ready to come down immediately, and those have been brought down, and that's, I think that was appropriate. But then they identified a, a number of others, including the granary, that should be, that should be retained and, and search for ways to do adaptive reuse of them, and certainly don't demolish them unless you have a project in hand that is ready to build, that's viable, that has the funding in place, and where you've gone through in discussing that with the community before you say, okay, we'll build that project because that's, that's enough better than having the structure here for an indeterminate amount of time, that it's worth it. But, but you don't tear down a structure in advance of that because that's an irre irreversible decision. And I have to say that, uh, you know, I've talked to a number of developers that have worked in a lot of situations like this, people like Fred Kent, uh, who works out in New York City, but has worked on Granville Island. Um, Rod Stevens, who was instrumental in the Pearl District. Mark Edlin of Girding Edlin, who has done a lot of green development in Portland and, and, and actually down in the Seattle area as well. And every one of them said that those structures are a key component to making this something special and making this community special when somebody looks for a place to land. That if you tear it down, that you lose, you lose that character. And that character is an important value that, that organizations like Google, for example, put a premium on when they decide where to land. Um, on the other hand, uh, there is a competing vision um, that was offered by Collins Warman, which is an architectural firm out of Seattle that was hired by the port to do a lot of work on providing a vision, sort of articulating the port's vision for what should be done. And that involved tearing down every structure on the site and pre presenting a blank slate to, for a developer to come in and, and do whatever they wanted to do. And when I talked to Fred Ken about that, he said, well, he said, those actually, those can work. But he said they work for about 20 or 30 years. And he said everything ages the same, and then it becomes old and shabby and less attractive to the community. And so I think that if you've got an opportunity to put in place a multi-generational improvement for your community, you don't want to do it for 30 years. You want to do it for generations to come. Then looking at the land swaps, the land swaps, I think it's good to, for example, for the port to manage Colony Wharf, which the city has owned for a long time, because it's more consistent with the port's key mission. But that was a cash flow positive piece of property the city had. The city made about $800,000 a year in rents from that. And in exchange for that, what we got was an area that's got significant environmental challenges to it. And when this was proposed some years ago, I pushed for inclusion of the granary and some land around the granary as well. And my rationale was the port was always saying the granary wasn't worth anything, so we'll take it off your hands for free, and, and we'll give the PDA something productive to do. I mean, I, I think that the PDA is an extremely underutilized resource, and part of the reason is because the port has never felt comfortable letting the PDA do what they were created to do. The, the, the public development... Of, oh, I'm sorry. It, the PDA is a public development authority, and so what that is, is it's a quasi-public entity. It's created by the city in this case, and what it does is it gives them an arm's-length relationship from the political powers, so we give them authority to do things, like we hand over property, and they can do a fair amount without having to run to the city council or the mayor every time they want to do something. And what that does is it means that they can act more entrepreneurially, they can get things done without some of the hurdles that otherwise put off developers or others that, might, that we might want to have come here because they can kind of run interference for development that might come forward. And it's been used successfully, for example, in the Foss Waterway in Tacoma is a good parallel example to what we're looking at here. It's also used for the Seattle Art Museum. It's a very successful device. Um, so we weren't creating something new here. But by get, letting the PDA manage some of these things, we've got the folks involved on the PDA that have the breadth of knowledge to help something happen. And these aren't people that were put there because they were trying to push my vision. In fact, a couple of them endorsed um, Kelly Linville when she ran against me. But there were people that I put there because I thought they had particular expertise that would help bring forward a positive redevelopment of the waterfront. And the person that was hired as executive director, Jim Long, 
is somebody who developed a couple million square feet of transit-oriented design in downtown Denver. And before that, he did some work around Boulder. And when he was first hired, I had some people complain to me because among the things he did is he helped facilitate getting a Walmart built outside of Boulder. And I said, well, the thing that impressed me was that he created a new county to get a development done in Colorado. And I want somebody that can get a new county done <laughs> on my side because that is somebody who can get things done. Um, but unfortunately, he's, you know, he's, he's doing some good work, but, but he's not doing nearly what we could get done if we fully allowed him um, reign to, to exercise his talents. Um, and then, and then uh, let's see. Oh, another thing that concerns me is, is the city is now asserting that the granary needs to come down because the best route into the waterfront is through where the granary sits. Um, and I can tell you that that wasn't true when I was in office. We'd actually engineered a route around the granary that allowed it to stay intact. We had federal dollars attached to that route that doesn't take down the granary, that moving those dollars so that you can actually um, reassign them to tear down the granary and put a road there instead um, puts those dollars at risk. So. You can probably do it, but we moved those dollars already once to get to the, to the location they're at now, ask them to move again, particularly in times when we're not sure if we can pay the Defense Department bills, let alone honor past commitments for, for roads in some place that most people in D.C. have never heard of. Um, there's a risk there that I think needs to be acknowledged. And then I think there's a, a continual missing of opportunities. You know, sometimes you get into a project and you have a vision about what you want to do. And as you start peeling up the layers of the onion, you discover that you can't do what attracted you to this project in the first place. And in this case, what I'm talking about is the ASB and the idea of a marina. The port, for very rational reasons, saw the ASB as something that would naturally be made into a marina and be a good fit for sort of their mission. But, and I've talked to a number of financial folks, including folks that are intimately familiar with all the port's finances, and they've said that it's never penciled out. That even in boom times, it would have required probably about a doubling of mortgage fees for every boat in Blaine and Bellingham from current boat owners. I'm sorry, the ASB is the Aerated Stabilization Basin. It's, it's where GP used to um, treat their water um, that they used in their operations. So it's just a big lagoon now. You can see it if, you're, if you look out from uh, up by the PAC, you look down, you can see the big lagoon out there. Um, but it doesn't make sense to use for, for a marina. Um, you know, even in the best of times, it didn't make sense. It makes less sense now. It would be prohibitively expensive. It would also require, even, even if you were thinking that you could manage it before, that was assuming that the city would upzone a lot of the land on the land side, that you would skim off all the profits from that and put it towards your rebuilding this marina, which is not something I heard articulated as a core value of the community as something we wanted. And there's a lot of other things on the waterfront that we can't afford that those funds would be better put towards. Um, but in addition to that, you know, if you start raising rates very much, we have a fishing fleet that's viable here now. We want to keep them here. We should actually be trying to get more of them here. And if you start having to raise your rates to accomplish um, building this marina, we're going to lose the fishing fleet, which is an important part of this community. But there are other things you could do with the ASB. In fact, I talked with Charlie Sheldon about one of them about six months into his tenure, and then he came back to me and said, you have to own that because I'll get fired if I bring that forward. Um, I guess he should have owned it anyway, but, <laughs> but, but that was, the city has a problem. We, we have um, sewage that about once or twice a year leaks into the bay because we have a combined sewer system, meaning we get some storm water into our sewage system along with the sewage. And if we have a high water event, a lot of rain and stuff, um, it can overflow. And EPA doesn't like that for reasons I agree with. And if it happens too much, which we've had, 
they say, okay, you have to build something that will keep that from happening. And what they've identified is we have to have a million and a half gallon capacity to deal with those overflows. Well, we could build a million and a half gallon tank someplace, someplace low, someplace down towards the waterfront, at a cost of about $15 million. Or we could adaptively reuse a million and a half gallons of the ASB, which has a six million gallon capacity, for a much lower price. And not only that, but if we did that, we could take the remaining capacity. We've got one of our largest employers in town is struggling to, to meet a BOD issue. Now, BOD is another acronym that you learn when, you learn a lot of acronyms when you're in Huxley, you learn even more if you're mayor. Um, BOD is biologic oxygen demand. And what that means is when they're processing fish down on the waterfront, or they had a company called Portionables making pre-portioned packages of stuff, when they're cleaning up, all that water goes into our sewer system. We have to treat it, and we have to get the, the biological elements filtered out to a certain extent, or we get in trouble with EPA. Well, some of those things are so small, they're essentially dissolved in the water, and we can't get them out. Um, so we're, we've required more and more of Bellingham cold storage to do so that we don't, have, so that we don't run afoul of EPA again. But there's a better solution. If we, if we would take some of the ASB capacity and use it as a settling pond and treatment facility for um, food processing, not only could we help BCS expand as opposed to maybe lose clients, but we could also perhaps attract some vegetable processing back into this county, which has been lost for about 20 years. Right now, farmers in Whatcom County are at a disadvantage because they have to ship their vegetables down to Skagit County, that's the closest place to get things processed. That means that they get less money for their product. Um, the, the, the quality is less because it has to go further before it can be processed. And jobs that could be here and used to be here aren't here. So we could, put the, we could take the ASB and convert it for that. Um, and then it could also, finally, and maybe most importantly, it would offer, if it's not being opened up as a marina, it could be used to take the cleanup spoils from the Whatcom Waterway that, that right now we're talking about shipping to someplace in eastern Washington when we finally get around to doing it. And, you know, I always struggle with the question of, of economic or environmental justice because intrinsically it doesn't seem right to me that we should take a mess that's in our backyard and ship it to somebody who takes it because of financial need. I think, we, I think around the world we need to be responsible for our messes. And I recognize that GP shipped everywhere, so you can make an argument. And I'm not saying that it would all have to stay here, but I think that we at least need to think about that. And if it's in the ASB, it's already a proven place that can take something like that. It would be secure, and it would be cost effective. So, you know, the bottom line is that when you look at the waterfront, there's a wealth of opportunities that continue to await us. But unfortunately, getting those opportunities done requires some tough conversations. You know, getting along can be easy, but getting the right things done frequently isn't. And so what I'd say is, if you want the right things to be done, you need to be willing to stand up and take unpopular positions that are going to alienate some of the community at times. So I think that it's important that we have conversations, um, but at the end of the day, you need to know where you stand and stand there. And uh, that's something I've also seen a lot at Huxley. And so, you know, I guess to wrap up, I'd say what I've learned at Huxley is see the big picture and push for what's right. Thank you. And now, I tried to leave time for questions because, as I was telling uh, Gene earlier, that I frequently find the most interesting things to talk about are the things that you guys want to hear, not what I've come prepared to say. Yes? I was wondering if you 
wondering if that was the case, what legal effect that plan has, and 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 how it's being changed now. Well, I guess what. Well, first of all, we never had an adopted plan. Um, that what that did is that changed the conversation to some degree. Um, and so we started moving in a different direction, but it was a lot of intense discussions to get movement. And, and, I, and I want to be clear, I think, I think compromise is a good thing. I don't think anybody has um, a monopoly on the truth. But, but I also think that, you know, and, and also what you see depends on where you sit. So the port, for example, is a, is a single purpose entity. Uh, and, and the city has a wide array of things that we're responsible to do. And so there, there's some inherent tension that's natural in that relationship. But at the same time, my experience was as the port came in and they felt very strongly that, that their way, that, that they'd put a lot of commitment into what they felt was the right way. And it was very hard to get movement. And in their defense, some of the reason that they, they reached that point was because there were a couple of years where there wasn't, the city wasn't weighing in very much for, for reasons that, that were, it wasn't anything nefarious. I mean, the, Mayor Asmussen resigned and so, you know, as he was kind of getting ready to take on his new job, he was not paying perhaps as much or as close attention because he knew he wasn't going to be in a position to make anything happen. And then Tim Douglas, Mayor Douglas, came in, and he was there for a year, and he kept things moving, but he didn't want to. Um, and I'm, I'm putting words in, 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 you know, thoughts, ascribing thoughts to them that I will own. You know, they don't have to own it. But, but Mayor, As Mayor uh, Douglas was there for a year, and so... You know, I think he did a good job in that year of kind of keeping things going, but he didn't make any strong pronouncements about this is what the community feels because he knew somebody else was going to be coming along that was going to be vested with that authority. Um, and, and whatever he said, somebody could just wait out, and it might change significantly anyway, depending on the election. So, so in that um, vacuum, the port was making decisions because decisions had to be made. So they were, you know, again, I don't want, this is not all negative about the port. The port was doing some things. But sometimes as you start making decisions and moving down a road, even if it's, you know, in my perspective, not entirely a, a correct direction, you still get vested in that. And you get irritated when somebody comes along and says, hey, wait a minute, wait a minute. I don't like the direction you're going, and I think we need to move. So, yeah, tip? Man, I think those are fantastic ideas you have about how to use the ASP, and I'm a little shocked that public officials have ignored that potential for so long. Um, aren't they building, like, spending many millions of dollars expanding the capacity of the sewage treatment plants? They are. And, I mean, don't they have a duty? I, was, I have two questions here, because it seems to me they should have a duty to not take capacity away when we're buying new capacity and we'll probably have to replace it anyway. It's not, not uh, uh, proper care of the rate base. Well, I, you know, I, I think that there's a little bit of conflation of the two issues. There's, you know, first of all, the city has never controlled the ASB, so we couldn't just take it. And I did have conversations with folks about alternatives and was rebuffed. Um, and so then you have to move forward because we're under an order from EPA to do something or, or not. Um, I think it would have been interesting to look more at that, um, but that wasn't possible at the time we had to make those decisions. Even though they were looking at those gigantic boxes with the pumps and everything for the yeah. storing the combined sewer overflows, it just didn't compute for them or something? But for the port? Yeah, for the public works and the port. Oh, public, public works got it, you know. Uh, I, I, Obviously, there's a lot of things that are had in discussions, but if you don't, if you if you have a partner that's not willing to let you use something, then there's that's not a, that's not part of the solution set. Okay, so it is about rational kind of consideration, and the other I missed the very the first part of your talk, so I'm, I'm presuming you got to it. But the other thing that really surprises me is that one million square feet of retail at Bellas Fair put downtown and central business district into a tailspin. For Decades. Right. And how do they expect to absorb six million square feet of uh, retail commercial? And uh, 
you know, that's a question I never really got fully a good answer for. But I will say that now at least they've, they've come down, and I think they're now talking about a million and a half, which I still think is way too large. Um, I, I mean, I think it's okay if it grows organically. But, you know, one of the things that, in, that informed my, percep my, my perspective of dealing with the port was the, that I felt like the port didn't always view, didn't, didn't share the same vision and understanding that I had. So, for example, in the early 1990s, when the port built where their current offices are, that was an economic development project by the port. And how did they fill those offices? They leafleted the downtown businesses that were in private buildings to get, to get lawyers and other folks to move down to the port's buildings. And, and they were successful, and it really damaged a lot of property owners downtown, and it damaged our downtown. Now, that was, those were different commissioners. It was a different executive director. Um, but, it, but it shows where if, if you're thinking about free cash flow as opposed to community interest, you don't always get to the same answer. And, and my concern is, as mayor, I think it's important to think about community interest and understand that not everybody else at the table is looking through the same lens that you're looking at. Somebody over here yeah, with the yellow shirt. Well, the, the port would like to have what they call a clean ocean marina. It would be a, a very large marina that could take extremely large yachts that we don't currently have capacity for here. Um, but the cost of doing that is, is very significant. You can't, if you do that, you can't use it for these other purposes. And there's not currently demand. Uh, my understanding is, and I don't, you know, this is just what I've heard through the grapevine, is that there's a number of boats that are currently in mortgages at, at various port facilities that are not paying their mortgage rates. Um, and that's not unique to, to our, to our uh, mortgages here. That's, that's a situation that's cropped up nationally because of the recession that a lot of people had to make a decision about what they maintained. And boats were something they could cut if they, were having, uh, if they weren't making enough money, if they lost jobs or whatever. Um, so, but, but that's the main thing that I've, I've heard as an alternative use for that. So I guess I have a question. Okay. I'm Fred Reinhardt, and I worked 32 years at that mill from 69 to 01. Uh -huh. uh, and I'm really concerned that they always talk around the toxic waste there and the multi-million dollars that uh, are liable there. And I want to be clear that the taxpayers of Watson County, city and county, are liable to whatever the port does. Uh, and I don't really hear uh, a, a really good, it, they talk about it a while and then they skirt around it. But quite frankly, that is a real mess of mercury and it should be uh, dug up and chipped out. I will guarantee you that if you ever try to put a service in there and put in your water lines, which are under a lot of pressure, uh, those water lines would be in a lot of that area where that waste is. And when they break, uh, it, it's really quite frankly like a, like a big bomb going off. It, uh, uh, it, it really does an immense amount of damage. And it would, it would expose anything that was capped or left there uh, to, to, for the future. And in the future, it would be us taxpayers who would have to meet the obligation of, of liability uh, for all the harm that might do. And I really, that's a real concern that they do get around. Another one would be, if we have a water table if, with global warming that is coming up, and it does sound a little silly, but right now the city of Vancouver in uh, uh, Stanley Park is being real concerned about the, the, the future of 20 years from now uh, of being able to work with this rising water table. And we're down at Georgia Pacific. I've seen that at high tide, and it almost, it almost comes up within two feet of the roadway there. And also, I, I, there's a lot of jobs that went out when that went out. Right, right now, you've got, the hot, you've got the deep water port, you have the railroad, you have the trucking service that is still there. Right. And I'd like to see that come back to good paying jobs. 
uh, and also, I want to see, did you, you talked about that pond uh, out there. For, is that what you were talking about me putting stormwater into? Or I no, I was talking about the, the ASB, the, 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 not the log pond, but the, the ASB, which is where, you know, they used to have, when you were working there, they'd have sprayers going out in there. Yeah, 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 that was where the lagoon, that yeah. covers 37 acres. Yep, that's right. And coming out of that 37 acres, there's a one mile pipe that goes out in the bay. Yep. And it was placed in a real certain place so that it didn't backwash into any part of the city or in this area. So it was really carefully picked, and it was also refined very clearly not to harm anything. Right. So you're pretty safe that way. But uh, uh, could this not be used as another way of distributing uh, 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 storm water? Or well, that's what I'm talking. That's it that's could be. I'm that's what I'm talking that about. That's a very yeah. good idea, and I compliment you on that. Yeah. You've got that service there. To turn that into a doggone marina is uh, is just not right with the way this city is building up, and, and could use, uh, like you said, maybe you put another tank up there. If anybody wants to know what a million gallon tank looked like. You go back to the old pictures of Georgia Pacific, they had eight million gallon tanks by the railroad track. Each yeah. one of those tanks was one million gallons. Wow. Well, okay. Uh, they had that. So well, I'm sure Jeff Jewell could find those pictures. But anyway, I, I did, yeah, yeah, but my big yeah. thing is that, that waste that, uh, is buried there. And, and yeah, it is. Well, I mean, that, and, and again, that's where you could take part of the ASB that, that where, where we could take some of the stormwater and put it there. But you could take some of that as a place to cap, you know, put the waste and cap it, too. It would be a lot safer there than, than where it is. Um, because all, the alternative is you, have, you do have to ship it all like 300 miles across the state, which is very expensive. And then it's just somebody else's problem. But you're right. The taxpayers are on the hook for it. That's... That's what we've agreed to at this point. So anything we do, we have to be very careful. I can go one step further. I can tell you not one of those port commissioners are capable of trying to put this big ball of million dollar operation together. And I, 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 uh, I, this is a big thing. So Helen, it's 137 acres. Uh, and this is a, a big thing for the, uh, a big, I mean, there could be a lot of people who could go to work there and make right. good money. No, I agree, and I, and, and I will say I'm glad to see they've got the one operation that's building some stuff for Shell, so you've got some good jobs there at the end down by the, uh, um, down by the pier. But, yeah, there's, there's, you've definitely hit on a number of, of issues that need to be paid attention to. So. I fully agree the granary building should go down, by the way. Well, and, and, we'll, and I'll disagree with you on that one. That, that building, if you ever, you know, I look underneath it, it is... Uh, when the tide comes in, the whole building underneath there is about one foot of water. Yeah, that's true. And, uh, it's, it's all okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'm gonna move. My yes. My question is about the proposals for developing the gravity. The port is currently looking at a number of proposals, preliminary proposals. Some are from local developers and architects, and some are from Canada and other parts of the United States. What is the mechanism for the port to consider those proposals? And since the local proposals would create local jobs. You know, you're, you're speaking to things that I really can't answer. I, I can tell you that f frequently there are prohibitions against giving a local preference because, because, they're, because, because, because what they want to avoid is they want to avoid the good old boy system where somebody just hands a job to somebody that's their friend as opposed to going through a rigorous bidding process. So there's good reasons why there's that prohibition. Um, Thanks, John. Yes? So that goes back to your statement about a plan was never adopted right. after all that community input. And we all right. said we wanted lots of parks and right. all that stuff. So my question is, who adopts the plan and what's well, the city and the port collectively do, and that's in process now. The draft plan was brought out by the mayor November 15th, I think, in the port. And so now it's going to go to the planning commission on the city side. 
and eventually it'll go to the city council. I saw a couple city council members are here. Um, and, and they'll ultimately weigh in on their side and the port, will, the port commissioners will weigh in on their side and both sides have to agree down to the, you know, every dot and, and you know, comma and everything. And then once they agree collectively, then that's the adopted plan that you have to operate under until you so agree to change it. Vote? Yes, yes, it will. And the, and the port commissioners? Yes. Vote? So like we did this, at one point we had one vote where we were moving along that line. Um, this would be back in like 2009. And we had a joint um, port commission city council meeting where they took collective action to make sure that everything was exactly the same. So do you anticipate a time frame on when that's going to? You know, I think they're trying to do it in the next few months, but I, I don't, you know, I, I can tell you that the wheels of government move very slowly. Um, <laughs> They're required, it, it, there'll be public meetings, so, and they'll have to do, yeah, there'll be a, a public input requirement. Yeah. yeah. Could you explain why the Port of Bellion has veto power over a land use plan or a neighborhood plan that normally would be adopted by the city? Well, it, it's part of just the process of the city and port trying to find their way together through this. The port owns all the, all the property. The fallback is if we don't adopt a comprehensive plan that the port likes, it'll stay. I mean, it was an agreement that was made under Mayor Asmundson that, that, it had to, that both sides had to agree to how the zoning was changed and that if, that if there wasn't an agreement, it would revert to light industrial zoning, which is the current zoning. But landowners don't usually get that kind of no. leverage. Is it because they're a government? Or why is it, it was an interlocal agreement. Yeah, it's because of an interlocal between uh, the city and the port when uh, Mayor Asmundson was in office. Yes? Uh, given the status of the interlocal agreements and the 10 years, 12 years of process, uh, where do you see right now the potential for students and the public to actually plug into creating the vision we want? In contrast, the public has said they want with the plans that are in hand, how can we actually make sure well, I, what I would do is I would encourage people to go to the city or port website and look at the proposed plan and then go back and look at some of the earlier plans, the, the, uh, the RUDAT plan, which you can find by Googling. It's still out. The Internet keeps things forever. Um, you can also look at some of the interim plans that came along between those. Um, you can talk to people like I know John has. You probably don't care about this anymore, do you, John? <laughs> <laughs> Um, you know, there's a lot of folks, the wa is the Waterfront Advisory Group, are they still intact? Because that used to be a... Okay, anyway, there's, what I would say is, is just start think. you know, read, read the plan as it exists, think about what you think is important. Try to read some of the older plans so you can see. I mean, actually, the plan highlights where a lot of the changes have been made so you can kind of follow along and see what those changes look like, see if you agree with them or not. Um, as it comes forward to the, and, and start weighing in with comments, you know, just, just like a lot of people have done with the, the terminal at, at Gateway Pacific, um, people have learned how to use that process and weigh in. You can weigh in in city and, and port processes as well. So the, the next big opportunity is going to be, you know, when it comes to the planning commission, but you can start getting comments and talking to your council member and your commissioner now. Can I follow up on Paul's question? Sure. Because it had to do with the zoning. And isn't the cleanup plan just bringing it up to industrial standards? I mean, isn't that the... It actually... Why would they even consider, if, I mean, this kind of seems ironic that if they can't reach an agreement on some more complicated zoning or revert to actually the cleanup varies according to it's a very complicated cleanup I mean I I don't fully agree with the way the cleanup is done but it's not just a flat industrial level it, it varies according to what they think is going to be there yes
right. is to cap it. Right. The other way to treat it is to ship it out. Yep. If you're talking about a third option, which is using that lagoon. Right. That Dredging it, putting it in the lagoon, and then capping and that. And, and you kill a more, you know, you kill two birds with one stone because you can treat the storm treatment, you know, storm water right. treatment. At the same time, you could roll, roll in this treatment of the toxic soil into that process. Well, no, actually, you would do that. The, the storm water would have to come after. You, first, you need to get the stuff cleaned up, put it in there, cap it, and then the storm water stuff would all happen over the cap or, over, or around the area that was capped. <laughs> and so, but that would still, but you've got a six million, six million gallon capacity. We need a million and a half for the, it's called a CSO, combined sewer overflow containment. And, and then again, you would probably still have at least a couple million gallon capacity left after that that you could use to help Bell Bellingham cold storage and other businesses that need. So you're moving the toxic soil all at once into that building. Yes, yes. And then I mean, that, that was, that's just. Um, so not shipping it right. out. Right. Where it is. Right. Yeah. yeah. Cheaper than shipping it out. It, it would be a lot cheaper than shipping it out. Not as cheap as capping where it is. Um, I don't know. Capping where it is, is, it's more subject to current action and things like that. So, yeah. I'm not cutting Dan off. For those who are in the class, it officially ended five minutes ago. <laughs> but to the extent that Dan is willing to stay, yeah. everyone else doesn't have to leave at this point. I'm just letting people know that the, the class is ending, so that might be why some people are leaving. Um, and for those who want to, when Dan's done, we're going to go down to Boundary Bay and have a little informal question and answer period, too. And that includes students for whom Western will buy you a beer. So <laughs> it doesn't happen every Boy, day. they didn't buy me a beer when I was a student. I know. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay.